Hello, this is Carl Steele for English 4113-4114 for spring 2022, talking about the Histoire des Jeunes Filles Sauvages by Marie-Catherine Omazel Eket, that is the history of a young wild girl, whose subject is Marie-Angelique Mimi Leblanc. Here on the left, we have an image from a graphic novel published in France by Morvan, Bevier, and Nusson called in English, Savage, the biography of Marie Angelique Leblanc, 1712-1775. And so she, here she is in the woods outside a small town in Northeast France, a place called saint gilles which is modern day Champagne or Champagne. And some French people come upon her and they say essentially, oh, good Lord, what's that? What's happening? And they set some dogs on her and you get a sense that she is going to fight those dogs off. So, uh, Marie Catherine Mazaliquet wrote this work in collaboration with this woman whom she befriended. Uh, Mimi Leblanc turns up in Northeast France. She um, doesn't speak a language that anyone understands. She seems to be, have been living in the woods for a long time. She is captured by a local lord. She then uh, gets some royal patronage from the, uh, some important French people. And she is put into a convent and then gradually um, she meets, um, meets people who are very important and they start writing about her. And she meets uh, Marie Caterina Mazaliquet, who is an important, uh, fairly wealthy woman who befriends her and decides to collaborate with her in writing a book to tell her story to ensure that her friend has enough money to live on because she has a sense that that royal money is starting to dry up a little bit. And so when Mimi Leblanc finally dies in Paris, at roughly, I think, 63 or 65 years old, she actually does have enough money because we can see that people are squabbling over her inheritance. The question is, of course, where did this girl come from, this woman who is trans transformed, as it were, from somebody who lived into the woods into a good, quote unquote, normal French woman. Well, one way to understand this is in terms of the history of wild children, children raised in isolation or by animals. So in the early period of such stories, such figures are figures of enormous importance. The earliest version is one told by Herodotus, the Greek historian about Cyrus of Persia. So he has an uncle who knows that this nephew is going to grow up and become the emperor, and he doesn't like that. So he throws him out to be raised by, into the, well, he throws him into the wilderness, and he's found by some poor people who raise him, and then gradually he returns and becomes the emperor after offing his uncle. The poor people who find, find him, one of them is in fact named a Persian word for dog, suggesting that the earliest version of the story was one in which he was found by dogs and raised by dogs. The Moses story may have similar undercurrent uh, because it's very similar to the Cyrus story. More famously, there's a story of Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome. Well, Romulus is the founder of Rome because he killed his brother Remus, but they were also thrown out uh, and they were found by a wolf who uh, protected them and raised them. And so here we have a very famous statue of a wolf. This is actually very, very old and the boys are Renaissance uh, images that are put underneath to kind of illustrate this story of Romulus and Remus. This is from a 16th century book called The Mirror of Roman Magnificence, which is at the Met Museum here in New York. Uh, there are many other such important, such figures of cultural importance who are raised by animals uh, who are more obscure to us now in the present day, people like St. Alvi of Ireland, or Wolf Dietrich in Germany, and so on. But really around the 13th and 14th century, such stories begin to significantly change. They start to merge with a figure known as a wild men. And then instead of having these figures being people who found civilizations or invent technologies, instead their time among animals or the time without other normal humans just leaves them destitute. And so you get, for example, the story of the wolf boy of Hesse, about which I can tell you more in class, or you can see another video I've done to see me talk about that at length, if that's what you want to do. Um, there's also like the sheep boy of Ireland, I can tell you more about him in class, and so on into the present day, it's in, in India, for example, Amala and Kamala in the early 20th century. I would say that most of these figures are probably mythical. They are figures that are about narrative, and they're trying to ensure that the culture hero is somehow separate from the common run of humanity by saying they're descended from animals that are their 
at least closely tied to animals. Uh, and into the present day, it has something to do maybe more with the status of the way that kind of stories that humans tell about themselves. So this is, of course, uh, the story of Mamie LeBlanc belongs to this kind of second strain of it, the stories of children who are raised in isolation and uh, seem to lose something because of that. But of course, there are lots of particular features about her that we'll be talking about in very soon. So the opening of the work that you read talks a lot about her origins, is trying to figure out where she comes from. So she's found in this small town, as I told you, Sanji. There's not a lot there, even in the present day, but I don't think my sense is that in the early 18th century there was much there either. So I think the town is probably very similar to what it, what it was 300 years ago. So in the introduction, there's a question, is she animal? Is she some kind of liminal being? A limin is that stone in between the uh, your front door and the outside. The limin is a boundary. So is she a liminal being? Is she some kind of boundary being? How does she pass from mere animal to the savage and from the savage to the civilized man is how the introduction to this book puts it. Is she Eskimo? That's a word that's actually a slur. The, peop the people who are called Eskimo call themselves Inuit. And we can see that the question there has to do with a lot of extremely racist attitudes about the Inuit that we encounter in this culture where they're considered to be subhuman. And this text says, no, no, she's not quote unquote Eskimo because she is a white skinned and white skin, of course, is being used here to indicate that she is of higher status. And so it says, no, she's Huron. She's absolutely Huron and insists on that from linguistic evidence and so on. Um, we also have some suggestion that she had some kind of contact with the Caribbean because she's carrying a weapon, which is called a butu. Uh, and so we see that word in modern Caribbean languages, Caribbean Spanish, and also English and Trinidad and Tobago, uh, where it means something like a short club, also used as a club to kill fish, also a police club, and also other uses, which you are familiar with if you know those languages. So um, there's kind of lots of evidence about different kinds of groups that she had contact with. There's a lot of question marks about who she is. A lot of that has actually been solved by a French surgeon named Franck Roulon, uh, who writes under the name Serge Arroul in some books that were published with very, very few copies. And I know about these books primarily from reading summaries of them elsewhere, but I have to be very grateful to him, but I also have some questions about the stories he's telling. So we, he has been able to determine, or he argues rather, that she's born probably around 1710, that she's of the so-called Fox people, which are they call themselves the Miss Meskwaki people in the Great Lakes. Um, and there we have an image of them actually from that great piece of Montreal document that I've already shown you. Um, she is, her people, many of them are uh, slaughtered by the French and she is enslaved. She's brought to Labrador on the far Eastern side of Canada. And then Inuit people actually burn the house of the woman who's enslaving her, um, a woman named the Madame de Cortemanche and the Madame de Cortemanche goes to France. She flees to France. She's got Mimi LeBlanc with her. And they arrive in Marseille in 1720 or so. And she essentially has to sell Mimi LeBlanc in order to pay the fees to get off, uh, off the boat into Marseille. Um, Mimi LeBlanc seems to be forced to work in some kind of silk manufacturing. And she seems to have escaped. And she runs across apparently plague-torn France, so enormous depopulation, and about 10 years later turns up in Northeast France in Sanji, 1731. She's found, as I've already told you. Um, when she meets Omaze de Quette, eventually they collaborate, as I said, they write a book together, 1755, so the words are Omaze de Quette's, but, uh, but at that point, Mimi LeBlanc certainly speaks French, and I think we, she probably reads it as well. So it's interesting just to have a story that's told by two women who are collaborating. That's uh, rather rare, I think. Then this work is translated into English, and that's the version you're reading, presumably in 1768 by William Robertson, who's a Scottish law clerk. Uh, and the introduction is written by James Burnett, his employer, aka Lord Mombato, whom you'll read about more for Thursday, who's a Scottish judge. So that is a lot of what we know. Now, the issue here, this is what Serge Arroyo has a.k.a. Franck Roland has managed to demonstrate by looking at various port records and lots of other archival sources. But then there's the question of her own memory. 
And she says she believes that she was in the shipwreck. She remembers going someplace warm. She remembers being painted black. She remembers various other things that don't seem to line up with the story that Frank Roland is telling about her. And we can maybe discuss that in class. I, I'm suggest, I'm thinking that because she was so young, it's possible she may have absorbed the stories of other people in that certain that silk manufactory, possibly, or maybe there's something else going on. So um, she dies in Paris, as I said, in 1775. So, Here's what I would like you to think about. Now, I've got a lot of text here, and I'm not going to read it all out to you, but I'm really asking you to consider the differences between Mombato's tone and the tone of Omazella Ket. So Omazella Ket knew uh, Mamie LeBlanc for a long time. They, they seem to have been friends, and they seem to have collaborated. Lord Mombato did actually meet her. He interviewed her. He wrote about her frequently. And my sense is that he either spent a day with her or a couple of days with her. He was in Paris doing uh, some kind of work for a really complicated legal case in Scotland. And he wouldn't have had the time to spend, say, a whole year or so speaking with her. So Omas Eliquette is writing, I think, as a friend and collaborator. Mombato is writing in a different way. And so I'd like you just to talk about the different ways that the preface reads versus uh, the text written by Omas Eliquette. And let me just read some of this to you just to get a sense of how you can maybe think about this comparison. So I, focusing on these particular passages, I think is the best way to do it. So here is Mombato trying to draw some conclusions from what he believes he's learned about Mimi LeBlanc. In this manner, the philosopher will discover a state of nature very different from what is commonly known by that name. And from this point of view, he will see that those superior faculties of mind, which distinguish our nature from that of any other animal on this earth are not congenial with it as to the exercise or energy, but adventitious, that is random and acquired being only at first latent powers in our nature, which have been evolved and brought into exertion by degrees in the course of our progression above mentioned from one state to another, that the rational man has grown out of the mere animal and that reason and animal sensation, however distinct we may imagine them, run into one another by such insensible degrees that it is as difficult or perhaps more difficult to draw the line between these two than between the animal and vegetable. So that is the kind of tone Mambato is taking in his introduction. Now we have Omazella Ket. Here's how she begins her work. Again, I think written in collaboration with Mimi LeBlanc. One evening in the month of September 1731, a girl nine or ten years old, pressed as it would seem by thirst, entered about the twilight into saint the village situated four or five leagues south of Chalon and Champagne. Champagne. She had nothing on her feet. Her body was covered with rags and skins, her hair with a gourd leaf, and her face and hands were black as a negro's. She was armed with a short baton, thicker at one end than the other, like a club. Those who first observed her took to their heels, crying out, there is the devil. And indeed her dress and color might well suggest this idea to the country people. Happiest were they who could soonest secure their doors and windows. But one of them, thinking perhaps that the devil was afraid of dogs, let loose upon her a bulldog with an iron collar. The little savage, seeing him advancing in a fury, kept her ground without flinching, grasping her little club with both hands and stretching herself to one side in order to give greater scope to her blow. Perceiving the dog within her reach, she discharged such a terrible blow on his head as laid him dead at her feet. Elated with her victory, she jumped several times over the dead carcass of the dog, then she tried to open a door, which not being able to effect, she ran back to the country towards the river and mounting a tree, fell quietly asleep. So that's how she opens that work. And then we have later on a discussion about her language. So this is Omaz Eliquette talking to uh, Mamie LeBlanc about her language. She describes it as kind of, she finds it terrifying. She finds the various sounds she makes terrifying, whether she's expressing happiness, or fear. And she recognizes that that's sort of a prejudice. It's not necessarily something that says much specific about the actual language itself. And then she tells a story about um, the terrible noises that she made 
when a strange man tried to take hold of her and she had a piece of meat in her hand and she shouted at him and she slapped him slaps him across the feet about across his face rather because she's so terrified and this is the story that Omazel tells about her language so here's what i would like you to do write about 100 to 150 words just a, enough for us to have material to talk about on tuesday talking about the different approaches that mambato takes versus omaseliket in terms of how it is they talk about this particular individual that they're writing about so i'm really looking forward to our conversation Thanks so much.